This is the city of the angels, Los Angeles, where I became part of the gang world. As we drive through my old stomping grounds in East LA, there is plenty of nostalgia connected to the familiar places I am revisiting. This little shoe repair place used to be Ford's. And it was a little uh, like a hot dog stand. And in, in front of Ford's is where a guy from White Fence that was out of bounds. He was in, in our territory. His name was Dirty Ernie from White Fence. And they caught him in front of Ford's and they doused him with gasoline and they killed him. When you are connected to a gang, defending its criminal honor is a paramount priority. In the case of Cheyenne Cadena, a high-ranking carnal and the only Mexican mafia member to be killed by a rival prison gang, revenge was indeed a factor. He was taken out by members of La Nuestra Familia, and word was received that one of their guys, Woodsy Reyes from Bakersfield, was heard loudly bragging from his prison cell, talking about the manner in which Shai had died. I vowed I would personally hunt this man down for his flagrant disrespect. My name is Ramon Mendoza, also known as Mundo. I am a former Mexican Mafia member who once specialized in murder, and I am here to talk to you about my life. Mundo, tell us about the uh, murder, the double murder that you uh, committed in uh, Bakersfield. The, uh, the murder of the Reyes brothers uh, was, uh, had its own separate story. It was, uh, the main target was named uh, Woodsy. Uh, Woods, Danny Reyes, he was a member of the Nuestra Familia prison gang, uh, rival gang. And uh, when Cheyenne was murdered, during this time frame in a lockup unit, Woodsy Reyes made a was making statements and uh, and poking fun at Cheyenne being killed. And one of the things that he said was that uh, when Cheyenne was killed, uh, that before he was killed, that he was begging for his life. And Woodsy made these comments while he was incarcerated to other NF members, and then the word got back to the MA that he was making these type of comments. Yes, he made them in a lockup unit. Uh, interacting with other NF members and as a way of, uh, of uh, throwing digs at the Mexican Mafia members, they couldn't get to him. They couldn't get to each other because they were locked on keep, keep away. Just to reiterate, he wasn't there when they killed uh, Cheyenne, Cheyenne, correct? That's correct. So, okay, so he was no, just talking. He, he was just talking smack. Yes, yes, he was okay. talking smack is what he was doing. Yeah. So, so while he was talking smack, I mean, there's certain things that you can talk about when you're talking smack, but there's certain mm -hmm. things that are uh, off limits. You, you cross the line. Yeah. And I think, uh, well, when the word got back to me, uh, I made a conscious decision. In fact, I vocalized it to uh, some of the members that uh, when I got out, I was going to make sure I track him down and take care of him. Uh, so when I was released, I remember getting a hold of uh, a Mexican Mafia member's sister who lived in Bakersfield, uh, Cyclona Gloria Perez, uh, who they call Cyclona and I gave her the names of three individuals that I was looking to target for execution. And one of them was Woodsy Reyes. Not too long after that, about a couple weeks, I think, later, I checked in with her again. Remember, in those days, we didn't have cell phones, so it was all, you know, landlines. I checked in with her, and she could not find the two of the targets, but she did find the residents, uh, Woodsy Reyes. Uh, we used, uh, ironically, Cheyenne Cadena's sister as a staging area to do this uh, execution. Cheyenne's sister uh, lived in Bakersfield, not, not too far from the Loma Linda residence of uh, Woodsy, Woodsy Reyes. And uh, so we used her home as a staging area, and from there on the morning of the, of the killing, uh, Sailor and I, accompanied by Cyclona, uh, went to the Loma Linda residence. And uh, Cyclona offered her uh, her uh, assistance uh, because she told us that uh, Woodsy's brother Ronnie who lived there with w Woodsy was he also a gang, mem gang member he was a, uh, a, a fel he was selling dope okay. with his brother but mm -hmm. I, I don't believe he was a prison gang member mm -hmm. uh, so she mentioned that Ronnie the brother of Woodsy mm -hmm. had the hots for her and that 
that she could get the door open for us. So we utilized uh, Cyclona to get the door open. Sure enough, Ronnie answered the door and uh, she got in and Sailor went in behind her and then I got off the car and I went in the residence. And we, we assumed that Woodsy was home. We looked for him. He wasn't uh, to be found. Ronnie said he had been out on a date. We proceeded uh, to kill his brother first. He's already an eyewitness. He's an adult. We killed his brother first and then we sat around waiting for uh, Woodsy. Uh, when Woodsy returned, we shot him to death. Did it take hours for him to return? Or? It took, yeah, it took about three hours. You're always navigating in uncharted waters when you're in this business. I mean, there's always something unforeseen that's gonna take place or can take place. We try to eliminate collateral damage. In this case, we'd never been in a situation where we kill somebody our main target hasn't arrived yet. So what if he arrives with his mother and a carload of kids? How are we gonna handle it? Okay, so we, we agreed that if they're adult eyewitnesses, they have to go. Because we already have a dead body in the house and here he comes in the house. What are you gonna do? You gotta, you gotta do what you don't wanna do. So, so we silently, we're hoping that that wouldn't happen. And so when he arrives about three, maybe four hours later with a, a teenage uh, young female, his date, um, we looked, Cyclona was keeping point. She saw the car drive up. We looked, we saw it. It was just him and a female. So uh, a sigh of relief that it wasn't a whole carload of people. But now my concern is we have an innocent female. How are we going to handle that? I don't know why. I, I, I felt that I could take control of a situation, no matter what situation in that criminal life, than anybody around me. So I blurted out to Sailor, you take care of Woodsy, grab him, take care of him, do whatever you got to do to isolate him, let me handle the girl. Okay, so we heard giggling we heard the sound of a key turning. The door opened, they walked in. As soon as the door closed, we emerged, Sailor and I. Sailor put a gun to Woodsy. Woodsy protested, said, hey, or whatever, you know, you could see him, you know, or hear him protesting. Sailor grabbed him by the collar and steered him at gunpoint away. The female, I had my eyes on her from the moment she, uh, she walked in. The female, her eyes went straight to my gun and she looked at it in shock like that was the the cobra that was going to strike yes and i guess anybody that sees a gun pointed at them you're, you're not going to be looking at your killer you're going to be looking at the gun it's like uh oh let me get out of the out of range or something so i pounced on that opportunity and i covered her eyes and lowered her head uh, almost in one motion and then what i did is i, I as i forcefully took her away to another room I'm continuously telling her, don't look at my face. Don't try to look at my face. You're going to be fine. We're here for your boyfriend. And uh, she was shivering. I sat her down in a chair. I blindfolded her first. Uh, then I put uh, some socks in her mouth that were in the bedroom. I gagged her. Uh, her whole body was trembling. And then I assured her as I tied her to the chair, I, I gave her some additional uh, comfort by telling her, uh, Remember, we're not here for, uh, to hurt you. We're here to take care of your boyfriend. So just be calm, be patient, nothing's gonna happen to you. And, and she kind of nodded. And then we, we left, or I left the room, uh, went to the other room. Uh, Woodsy uh, was there. Sailor had already did the, the usual questioning we would do if we going into a house to take somebody out that, that messes with drugs. He asked him, where are your drugs? Where's the money? Where are your guns? We figured we're gonna kill him anyway. If he's got money, drugs, or, or guns, we'll take that with us, okay? And he had re responded in the in negatively. Uh, on all three? On all three. Uh, Woodsy asked, uh, where's his brother? He said, where's my brother? And I told him, don't worry, you're gonna be seeing him soon. Well, his brother was already dead. So that was my smart ass communication yeah. to him. Sailor's going like this, thumbs down. In other words, no, no need to talk to him anymore. Let's just do it. 
So I opened fire into him. And as his body was on the ground and he was uh, dying, I barely hear his voice, very weak. He said it was fading. Uh, he said, don't shoot me anymore, I'm dying. Uh, and it was kind of like the Wicked Witch and the Wizard of Oz, mm -hmm. when the witch is melting. Uh, Cyclona comes into the room and she's spitting on him because Cyclona, the girls inherit our enemies. Mm -hmm. So they feel the same venom that we do. And uh, so Cyclona was compelled to come in and start spitting and kicking the Plus, dying she was body. from Bakersfield and right. Cheyenne was from Bakersfield. Of course. So they were probably homeboys, right? Home girls. And there's always a gang yeah, element to course. all this, yeah. a twist in there, whatever. Yeah. Uh, but I had walked into another room and and she's there, you know, go, go, uh, whack, uh, spacing out on, on, on Wootsie's dying body. And, and Sailor hands her the 38 and says, there's one bullet left, go ahead. Said, you know, don't, don't get all excited, do it the right way. And so he hands her the gun and she fires a bullet into the dying body. That completed, at that time, my revenge for uh, Cheyenne Cadena's uh, death. That brought me satisfaction. So at the time that Woodsy is dying, just before I pull the trigger, I remember telling him, Te manda saludes el Cheyenne. Mm -hmm. So that was my way of telling him, uh, Cheyenne sends his regards, mm -hmm. um, uh, which is something that I had done previously on, in another situation. I had, uh, I, I had foresaw the attack that the Mexican Mafia did on the Nuestra Familia and I had uh, carved in a, in a door, uh, Fe Feliz Navidad, because they, they, they killed the ENF guys on Christmas Day. Merry and Christmas. Merry Christmas. Mm -hmm. And Te Manda Saludos El Cheyenne. Mm -hmm. Cheyenne says his regards. regards. So they found that afterwards, took pictures of it. And, yeah. That young lady that was part, supposed to be part of collateral damage, why didn't you kill her? I would have killed her if she'd have, if she'd have looked at me. Yeah. And I didn't want to do that. Because so you felt that she only looked at the gun at the time? Yes. Okay. I, I was, in fact, I was teased about sparing her afterwards yeah. by some of the fellas, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah, they, 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 they accused me of being a sucker for a skirt. You know, mm -hmm. in other words, sucker for a woman. And I laughed at that. I said, no, no, nobody's butt was on the line but mine. If she'd have recognized anybody, it would have been me, not Sailor. So I would have been the one that would have suffered. So I made that decision on the spot if I'd have thought for a second that she saw me, or if I'd have thought that she saw Sailor, then I, I would have taken her out. Mm -hmm. You know, end of story. But that isn't the way I rolled. And that isn't the way the fellows rolled either. Mm -hmm. you know, they try to isolate their targets and they didn't want that kind of damage. We all have sisters, we all have uh, uh, daughters, and, and you know, the, the, the ladies are the members of the gentle sex, mm -hmm. so. Let me ask you a question, um, Cynthia. You since saw her in court later. Uh, yeah, Cynthia uh, is the female that the date the, that yes. was with Woodsy that I spared. Uh, have you ever heard back from her? Is there anything you want to say to her, if she might be watching this episode? Uh, no, no, I, I don't. I don't do subliminal messages, but uh, I can tell you that uh, Cynthia. I, I, I'm glad that I spared her. I'm, I'm glad that uh, she was somebody's daughter, and I know Woodsy was too, and, and Ronnie, but uh, Cynthia wasn't part of the crime world. So uh, we found no glory in taking out somebody like Cynthia. And when I saw her in the preliminary hearing, uh, she could not I identify anybody. I hope she's doing well and, uh, and uh, that she's never in a situation like that again. Okay, so uh, let's fast forward to the arrest and what happens on the grapevine. You're, the crime has just been committed. You're fleeing the scene with, I believe it's Cyclona, right? Yes. And Sailor. Yeah. Can you tell us about that and what happened up the grapevine? Yeah, when we uh, when we were leaving the scene, the, the, the murder weapon was supposed to have been disposed of uh, in Bakersfield, and it wasn't. I thought that it was not in the car, so it was in the car. And, uh, and the only way I found this out is because as we uh, mounted the grapevine, which is uh, a part of the, uh, of the interstate, uh, Highway 99, that reaches a high elevation before entering Los Angeles. And uh, so as we're driving on the uh, interstate, uh, Cyclona and Sailor are talking. My eyes are, are everywhere. I'm looking at the terrain in front of me. I'm looking at, through my rear, at my rear mirror. 
uh, because I know that we're wanted people. And we, we were not aware that they knew what we were driving or anything, but I didn't, never wanted to assume that. So as I drove past a clearing, uh, somewhere maybe near Gorman or one of those little towns there, I, there were two highway patrolmen in a clearing standing outside their vehicles, uh, one facing the interstate, one facing uh, the other officer. And the one facing the interstate suddenly tensed did a double take and I caught all that in a split second. When I saw that, I knew they were going to be behind us. So I, I, I quieted Sailor and Cyclona down and I told them, okay guys, uh, whatever, if we have any contraband in the car, we need to get rid of it now because I think uh, there it is, here they come, they're following us. It was a California Highway Patrol uh, car. And so uh, Cyclona, said, well, what about the gun? And I'm looking like, what gun? And Sailor says, yeah, it's a, we got we got to get rid of it. And then I find out from Sailor, that's the murder weapon. So the craziest part of this is they remained about a quarter of a mile behind us. And uh, it, so I'm, I'm assuming they don't want to pull us over because they have an APB. They were armed and dangerous and all, you know, with those warnings that they give out. So they're probably called ahead and they probably have uh, officers mobilizing on, on the other end and they're going to affect the stop somewhere. So we have time to get rid of the murder weapon and I'm trying to find an area on the, on the grapevine. And so we would occasionally, when we're hitting curves, catch blank blind spots. So at one of those blind spots, I told Cyclona to, to throw the weapon out the window. So she heaved the, the, web, the murder weapon out the window and you know there's mile markers back then at that time. And so I guess every mile there was a marker and of all the luck in the world, the gun hit a mile marker and bounced back into the freeway. So I was like mortified as I'm driving thinking, oh man, hope they don't find it. And behind us was a big rig the driver later testified that he saw what appeared to be a weapon coming out of the car and that it bounced in front of his truck and that his truck went over the gun and he doesn't know if he ran it over or whatever but apparently at the in the at the end of the day his truck ran over the gun and it destroyed the barrel sufficiently to the, where they could not uh, do a ballistics and so it went from bad luck to good luck but we didn't find that out till later. The Lake Hughes Road exit, uh, coming off the grapevine, uh, right under the 76 gas station sign, is where there was a, uh, a gauntlet of uh, black and white units. I call it a gauntlet because they didn't do a roadblock. Uh, they had already cleared other cars from there, and then the, I'm sure the chippies behind us was probably doing the same, but there were no cars uh, that I could see ahead of me. And there was nothing but black and whites on both sides of the freeway. And they were armed, they had their guns out. And then on, a, on an intercom, I could hear uh, one of the officers commanding that I pull the car over and, uh, and to slow down and pull the car over and move to the right. I remember telling the occupants of my car to uh, put their hands in plain view so that some young cop doesn't panic and open fire and you know, we get killed in a, they may think we're armed or something and any wrong move, they may misinterpret as us going for the gun. And everybody complied and as I pulled over to the right and uh, they, one by one, they made the occupants get out of the car. I was the last one and I, I thought I had put my car in park, but it was in neutral. So if I take my foot off the brake, the car's gonna lurch forward. And so I'm thinking, these guys will open fire thinking I wanna uh, get away. So I just stood there and they're, they keep uh, commanding me to get out of the car and I keep, uh, they can't hear me because they're at a distance. So there's one uh, officer, Officer Velasquez, uh, LA uh, Sheriff's uh, deputy, he, he walks up with his gun drawn, he points it at my head, the driver's side, 
and he tells me, uh, don't even think about it. And I told him, look, calm down. Look at, look at my foot, it's on the brake, but also look and see that I'm on neutral. So tell your guys that I want to put it in park. So he saw and he, and he told them, uh, you know, the car, he's going to, he's going to move his hand to put the car in park. So I got him covered. So I went ahead and engaged the car and then complied with his orders. Fast forward to the booking process. Uh, I, if you can just go and talk about the occupation part of it and what was put on the booking slip. Well, as, uh, as everybody knows who's been booked, uh, or if you're a police officer, when you book somebody, there's a, there's a booking slip that's generated for the incoming uh, resident or uh, inmate. And so when the one officer got to me and then he asked under my occupation, uh, he asked uh, what my occupation was. And I said, uh, just put anything you want. He kind of smiled and he said, okay. So he typed in on the booking slip, uh, hitman. I looked at it and I wanted to laugh because I found it humorous, you know, occupation hitman. I told him, uh, just remember, I didn't, I didn't put that down. He said, okay. And, so and it I, stayed there? It stayed there. Really? Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. I still have the booking slip. Members have kept their existence a secret, but police say they're very real and their lifeblood is murder and drugs. Well, Paul, they have three to 400 members in prison and you double that on the outside. They have a long, violent, bloody history and the fact that people are starting to turn up dead suddenly could serve as a wake-up call that the Mexican Mafia, or La MM, is no myth but instead a cold-blooded reality. After literally getting away with murder, both inside and outside of prison, I found myself in custody for the Bakersfield murders of the Reyes brothers and was locked up in the Kern County Jail. The media outlets connected me and the two homicides to the Mexican Mafia and religiously covered the pretrial court proceedings. For several years, death and violence had been my constant companions. Because I was programmed to perform nothing of redeeming value, I was prepared to face the consequences of my actions and expected to spend the remainder of my life in prison. Little did I know there was something on the horizon that would alter my life's course. Mundo, you've committed these two murders. You get arrested. Uh, during the broke booking process, they basically say your occupation is a hitman. What happened after that? While I was in the county jail, they allowed people to visit in the uh, jail from the outside. And these were people from the churches and I would typically ignore them, and pretend like I was asleep. One day I got bored and I decided to interact with an old gentleman, you know, over 80 years old. That's where a relationship began, where I'd look forward to him coming and we'd talk. He was a Christian, he was a born again Christian and, and I didn't want to hear it but I didn't mind the uh, interaction. And the more I got to know him, the more I thought, man, why would an old man like that care about somebody like me? Uh, and the people that, he, that came in with him, they were so genuine and so uh, full of happiness. Why would they care about somebody like me? So that was the first thing that, that hit me, that impressed me, is that these guys were for real. They weren't playing some kind of a joke or a game. And so as time went by and talking to the old man, I had uh, a time to reflect on my victims. Many that I killed in prison, there were many that I killed on the streets, and there were some that are adjudicated that I've been able to share with you. And uh, so I started thinking about how I had disposed of these people, whether I had shot them, strangled them, or stabbed them to death. And I replayed every one in my mind, and I pictured them dying, how they must have felt when they died, but more importantly, how their families must have felt at the knowledge that their loved one had died. So that was remorse. Remorse is a word that was not in my vocabulary. And now all of a sudden I'm feeling it, I'm experiencing it. Is this something that the preacher talked to you about, having remorse, or is it something that just came naturally? Yeah, no, no, he, he never brought up the topic of remorse. That was something that was, uh, uh, he sparked it because he sparked introspection. I got to thinking and that's something I never did before. When you're a member of a prison gang and you're demented and you're already on that road and you think 
my life is over. I got life in prison, so I might as well play out my hand. I'm hardcore, right? You never take time to think about what you are doing and to be honest with yourself. If I was honest with myself as a smart guy, I would know that that path that I had undertaken was not a good path. This isn't something that a normal person does. But I would never allow myself the luxury of self-introspection because I was afraid of the answer, that I was doing the wrong thing. We've already covered the events surrounding some of the abuse that you endured as a child at the hands of your stepfather. You were crying yourself to sleep, things like that. You, you mentioned that you read this tract and it was about a little boy. Can you tell us about how that spoke to you? When the Christian people would come in to visit the inmates uh, and I would ignore them, they would nevertheless leave information, Christian information on the bars. And one of those was a tract, like maybe a, an eight page or 10 page uh, booklet that you open up and it's got cartoons. And so there was this one character of a, of a boy with big eyes and he had a father who was very abusive and would beat him regularly. So in this one uh, scene here, the father beats his son severely, tosses him out the house and it starts to rain and he's out there shivering and he dies. Two angels come for him and escort him to heaven. And he's smiling as he recognizes that he's been saved and that now he's uh, on his way to heaven. That left a very strong impact because I recollected my dad's abuse when I was a youngster. At that time, I remember crying and remember, there's no audience. So I'm not around other inmates. I'm not around uh, any, any officers. So I could freely cry without worrying about anybody seeing me. Because you know, there's still that macho in you that you don't want to be you know, sobbing and breaking down. Like, uh, God used them uh, to wear me down. I knew who I was. And, and because I never allow myself to think about what I'm doing in my life, I don't have to face uh, those stark facts. I just continue living that life. So now as uh, remorse sets in for my victims and I recognized immediately that I had shown weakness. So it was like a voice telling me, dude, you're no good anymore. You've shown weakness. That was my first major hurdle. The bigger hurdle was something that the old man was preaching and that was that God forgave everybody. I found that hard to believe. I felt the deputies that escorted us to the courthouse, even though they were professional, uh, if looks could kill, we'd be dead on the spot. I'm sure they hated our guts. My victims' families, I don't expect their forgiveness. Uh, I think the average American, the average person is not gonna forgive somebody that takes out one of their kids. Um, so I understood that. I don't think I could forgive myself. I felt, okay, this is who I am. I'm going to continue doing what I'm doing. And I think most guys today, no matter how tough they think they are or they act, you know, or, or how much time they're doing, they think it's all over, this and that, they're not considering their souls. I think if they're honest with, them, with themselves and had to do it all over again, they wouldn't do what they were doing. There was something inside me that started to change. I started to feel like there was something different and there was something to what the old man was saying. The more I read his, uh, the Word, uh, the Bible, the more I decided I wanted to receive the forgiveness that he talked about and that the Bible talked about. So one night I got on my knees in my cell. I unloaded everything that I could think of that I had done, all the murders, all the, all the criminal stuff, all my sins. And I asked the Lord when I'm unloading, I said, if there's anything else that I forgot, I'm sorry, but I'm sure you know. And with that, I felt like something left my body, like relief but almost something physical that exited my body. From that point forward, I knew that something different was gonna happen. The assumption is that I was gonna get convicted of uh, double homicide, possibly. Uh, I really felt strongly that we could beat the case. Some interesting dynamics took place in court. 
there was a delay that was caused by the DA's office. Our attorneys jumped on it, filed a, a petition or a motion to dismiss for lack of speedy trial. We had a sympathetic judge that dismissed both murder counts on a legal technicality. So I was so overjoyed with that. Any criminal who beats a case, especially a case that he knows he committed, is going to be ecstatic. And now I had uh, my parole discharge was coming up in about a month and a half. Now I'm thinking, how do I make this right? How do I turn my life around and give back and atone for what I've done? Not realizing that from a, my Christian perspective, you don't need to do that. You've been forgiven. But somehow I couldn't grasp that there was still something more I had to do. So I made a decision that I was going to work undercover uh, for the prison gang task force. And so I, uh, I got word through my mom to my parole officer that I wanted to speak to somebody from the SSU. Some agents came to visit me and then a relationship ensued that would put me on the streets for a 14 month period in which I worked undercover uh, with the prison gang task force. My transformation to Christianity was the real deal and not just another jailhouse conversion. My heart's change was only known to my family and the church people. The fellas knew nothing about this and neither did the task force. I told them I was tired of killing, couldn't bring back anyone from the dead, and wanted to help put away the men who were doing the things I once specialized in, mainly taking out people. Sort of an atonement for my evil deeds, I believe is what I said. Because of my standing and performance as a made member, I would enjoy the deep cover anonymity necessary to avoid suspicion, which would make me a successful undercover operative. I was proficient at cheating, lying, and all the extreme criminal characteristics that came naturally. With the exception of Sailor Boy, my homeboy, close friend, and true carnal, my mission was to take down as many as I could without being detected. Returning to La M as an undercover operative would prove to be successful, but navigating in those shark-infested waters would also reduce me to the old mundo.